So let's walk through the scenario we just saw where more objects uh, in a single scene is not always harder for cross-situational learning. And let's use Bayesian inference to implement that intuition we have of how when you see scenes one at a time, as you build up that information, you can disambiguate. You can figure out what, for example, Manu actually refers to across all of these scenes. And so we'll see uh, what's called sequential updating for Bayesian inference. That is, instead of calculating the posterior probability just once across all three scenes, we get it incrementally. We process one scene at a time. Okay. So here are hypotheses about what Manu could refer to, say, could refer to any one of these objects, objects one through four here. And since there are four hypotheses in the hypothesis basis at this point, right, if we assume that there's uniform probability for them, because we don't have any reason to think that Manu refers to one object versus another, then the priors are just going to be one over four, right? One of four possible options. So that's your prior. Now what about our likelihood? So we can calculate the likelihood, which is the probability of Manu being said if that hypothesis was correct. And so we can just walk through this one at a time. If Manu meant that object, would you say Manu in this scene? And the answer is yes. And in fact, it's the only object you would say Manu for. So you have just one total. Okay. And the same is true actually for our other hypotheses, right? If Manu meant each of these objects, we would say Manu in this scene. And since Manu can only mean each of those objects for each of the separate hypotheses, then the probability is just one. One out of one, that's when you would say Manu when that object is present. Okay, so our likelihoods are all one. Fantastic. And because we'll actually be using the posterior probabilities for this sequential updating, we need to actually do that normalization step. It will matter a little bit more for the next data point than it will for this one, but let's just practice how this is going to work. So you calculate the likelihood times prior for each of our hypotheses, which is one, one of the likelihood times one fourth of the prior, so you get one fourth total for each, and you sum all of these to get the denominator, which in this case is going to sum to one. So when we do our posterior, we divide each of the individual hypotheses, likelihood times prior, which is one fourth, divided by that total, which is one, to get a posterior of one fourth for each of our hypotheses. So the interpretation is that after this data point, all our hypotheses are equally likely, which is what you would expect intuitively after this. Manu could be any one of these four objects. Okay, so now here's the sequential updating part. The posterior probabilities for data point one become the prior probabilities for data point two. So in this case, right, whatever we got over here now moves to become the prior for the next step. So we have our priors, and now we can calculate the likelihoods for data point two. So let's look at data point two, and we can say, okay, so what's the probability that Manu would be set in this scene? Well, that object is present, so we would say it, so therefore likelihood one. What about these two? These two were also present. Great, likelihood one for each one of those. What about this guy? Well, he's no longer present, so his likelihood is zero. We would not say Manu if Manu referred to that guy because that guy isn't present. Okay, so now we have our four likelihoods because again, we'll be using the posterior probability for subsequent updating. We need to do that normalization step. So we're gonna get each of our likelihood times priors for each of our hypotheses. And notice now that that last hypothesis, because his likelihood is zero, the likelihood times prior therefore is zero. So we have three uh, hypotheses that have some probability and one with none. So when you sum these things, you end up with a sum of three fourths because you only have three hypotheses. And now you can see how this posterior works. So we take each of our individual likelihood times prior. So for hypothesis one, that's one quarter. You divide it by that three quarter sum we just saw and you get one third. And in fact, you'll get the same thing for hypothesis two and hypothesis three. Hypothesis four is zero divided by three quarters, which gets you zero, right? So now you can see our probability is distributed between the three remaining hypotheses. So here's our posterior. Hypothesis four has been ruled out, but the other three are equally possible. So then, once again, because we're doing sequential updating, these posteriors become the priors for our last data point. So we move them over, and let's look at this last data point, right? We've got our priors now. Basically, hypothesis four is out of the running because its prior is zero from the previous ones, but our other three are still in the running according to the prior probability. Okay, so for this hypothesis, what you know, if Manu meant that guy, would you expect that for this data point? And the answer is no, because that object doesn't appear. So that likelihood is zero for hypothesis one. For hypothesis three, it's the same problem. That object doesn't appear. You wouldn't expect Manu to be said if that's what Manu was referring to. 
Now, hypothesis two is actually the same as hypothesis four, right? So hypothesis two refers to that little green guy, and hypothesis four refers to the little orange guy, and both of them are present in this data point, right? So the likelihood under each of these hypotheses for this data point is one. Right, so it doesn't matter that hypothesis four has already been ruled out. Likely it only cares if you can account for the data that's present. So that's why both the likelihoods for hypothesis two and hypothesis four are one. Both objects are present. You can account for this data under these hypotheses. So the likelihood for hypothesis two is one. The likelihood for hypothesis four is one. Right, so we get these as our likelihoods. So since this is the last data point, we don't actually need to do the normalization step unless we wanna get a probability that's exact rather than just a relative sense. But we should do it just for practice, just to again show you how this process works. Okay, so if we do the likelihood times prior, you can see the only hypothesis that has any probability left is hypothesis two, the correct one, right? But once again, and that's because hypothesis one and three have zero likelihoods, and hypothesis four has a zero prior, right? So hypothesis two is the only one left, but again, if we wanna get an exact probability, what you would do is sum all of these, and you get the sum of one third, and then we calculate our posterior by simply taking the likelihood times prior for each one and dividing it by that sum. So if you divide zero by one third, you get zero, and if you divide one third by one third, as with hypothesis two, you get one. All right, so this shows us that great, only hypothesis two is left, and that is in fact the correct hypothesis.